Christy Overton Johnson, and I want to welcome you to More Monday. You know, I'm excited about tonight because we're going to learn how to play the game. We're going to learn how to have victory against the wiles and the schemes of the enemy, which is the devil, Lucifer, Satan. I'm not sure what you call him, but I just call him a defeated foe. Tonight, the picture on the board is going to get back with a funny story that happened to me this week. But out of that story will come an analogy and will become um, lessons, I believe, that will help us have victory. Because first of all, we got to know what game we're playing. And we've been doing an awareness series for many weeks, becoming aware of who God is, being aware of who we are, but also being aware who the enemy is and the game that he's playing. Because if we don't even know we're in the game, game that we're in the battle we will not know how to play we will not know how to win and the reality is is that when Jesus Christ died on the cross and when he ascended to heaven and he gave us his Holy Spirit and he gave us his word he has given us everything that we need to live a victorious life the life of more here on this earth today you know I'm really grateful for eternal life and the Bible is very clear how we can have eternal life through our faith in Jesus Christ but I am so grateful also that we can have an abundant life here on earth. That doesn't mean that all the trials and all the tribulations will go away. The Bible, in fact, guarantees that we're going to have struggles. But what the Bible does also guarantee is that we will have victory over every single one of them, that we can count it joy, that even though we will face trials in this world, that Jesus has overcome them. And he lives in us. We've already studied that. We've studied who we are. We've studied about him and how powerful he is and how powerful he is and how much he loves us. But what we are often ignorant of, at least I was for many decades, is that we have a real enemy that's not just this little devil in a suit that is waiting for us to go to hell. He is alive and he is active in this world today and he is seeking to kill, steal, and destroy. If you read John 10.10, 10, that lays it out very clearly that there are two entities in this world. There is God and his angels, and there is the enemy and the fallen demons. One is out to give you life, and we talked about this last week. If we lined it all up, I mean, you've got one that wants to give you life, to give it to you in abundance, that you would experience more every single day, more peace, joy, that you would prosper in all that you do, in your health, in your dealings, that you would be successful so that you change the world. And then you have the enemy of darkness that seeks to kill steal and destroy. And that's what John 10, 10 says. It lays it out. I have come to give you life, God says, to give it to you in abundance, to defeat the works of the enemy. And you've got the enemy that is roaring like a lion. He is seeking somebody, trying to find a way into our life. Why? So he can devour us. Not just knock us down, but trample us. He wants to stop everything that God's put in us. He wants to um, He wants to keep us from experiencing peace and joy. He wants to hold us in captivity and fear and confusion. And I'm going to use an example tonight. Um, I'm going to share this analogy first about the picture of the week. And then I want us to turn to Nehemiah, which is just, if you don't know where it is, if you find Psalms and Proverbs, go to Psalms and then back up two or three chapters to the left. It's in the Old Testament. And I was thinking about this this week. This story really gives us a great picture of how the enemy works and how he works through people. And a lot of times we only see the people that are coming up against us. We only see them, their mouths move, moving and we hear the words that they're speaking. We feel their actions or their blows. But what we don't realize is that behind every evil action is an evil source. And that evil source is always seeking to stop the work of God in you, to quench the fire of God in you, to make you give up and retreat. And so we're going to study Nehemiah because it's going to show us the tactics of the enemy, and it's also going to show us how to defeat the enemy so that we carry out the plans and purposes that we have been designed to fulfill. So this picture of the week, 
You know, I always try to have something that we can relate to and it might be funny. Well, this is a checkerboard, and this week I brought checkers out. I love playing checkers. It was something that my granddaddy Charlie and I played together all the time when I was a little girl, and I can just remember he'd get down to the end, and he'd get into that king line. He'd go, king me, and we just had so much fun. Well, I have a Ukrainian girl staying with me, a young girl uh, from the Ukraine. She's been with us now six months, and um, will be with us for a while longer. And we were playing checkers this week. I was like, have you ever played this? And we're kind of trying to communicate through broken English and broken Russian. And and so we we bring out the checkerboard, one that I'd gotten at Cracker Barrel. It's, you know, covered up half the table. We had our big checkers. And we're playing, and I get down, and... And all of a sudden, she goes in reverse. She doesn't have a king, but she takes her man and she starts going backwards and jumping my man. I said, whoa, 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 what are you doing? And she says, what? Yes, yes, I can. I said, no, you can't. Only the king can go backwards. Da, da, yes, yes, in Russian. And she pulls out like YouTube Russian, like I'm going to understand what she's doing. And we're watching the game. And we were playing two separate games. Okay, I'm playing United States American checkers, which you only go one direction until you're the king, and you can only jump one spot unless you have, you know, an ability to jump more. Well, the way they play it is almost more like chess. You can go down a whole diagonal row. You can jump some somebody either direction, if you, and if you miss a jump, they can steal the man, steal your man if you miss it. It was crazy. And so here I am trying to win a game, and she's trying to win a game, and she's she's pulling stuff out and taking me left and right with rules I didn't even know existed because we were playing two separate games. And, you know, when I discovered the enemy's rules the way he plays, he don't play fair. And if he's got a chance to jump you, he don't care which direction he's going to go, he's going to take you out. And if you aren't aware of the game that he's playing and you're not aware of the rules of that game, and the directions and the ways that he could take you down, you're going to be captured. And so I put this up here to remind us, and, and, I, and, I, and I like her game, and I've learned the rules, and I think I actually beat her at her own game because it had a lot of strategy to it, and it was a lot of fun. But the reality is I wouldn't have won if I didn't learn the rules. She was, she was cleaning house in ways that I didn't even know could be done. And so today you might be going through life and you just feel like your clock is being cleaned. I mean, you are around, you just go and everything's good. You think you got victory and all of a sudden, wham, you're captured. And you're like, no. And the devil's like, oh yeah, yeah, that's within the rules. And so you're playing two different games and I don't want you to be defeated. I don't want to be defeated anymore. And so we're going to talk tonight by using the chapter, the book of Nehemiah and his life and we're going to learn about the enemy's tactics. So, a little background about Nehemiah. Nehemiah was a cupbearer to the king. And he had in his heart that he wanted to leave the king that he served. And he wanted to, and I can't say his name. I'm just going to have to call him King A or, or Tarsaurus or something. Anyway, um, he had in his heart that he wanted to return to Jerusalem to rebuild the wall around Jerusalem because he knew that his people, God's people, were left exposed and they were being um, just plummeted by the enemy. And God had put it on Nehemiah's heart and he knew it was the Lord because he and the Lord walked close. He knew the God was call he knew God was calling him to go back to Jerusalem. God gave him a very um, detailed plan, and we see if you study Nehemiah, you see how he very methodically carried out that plan. He didn't rush ahead. I mean, that's how we get in trouble a lot of times. We rush ahead, blabbing to everybody what God's told us we're going to do. I have done this so many times. God's put this on my heart to do, and you don't know how you're going to do it, but you also don't know who wants to oppose what you got in your heart to do. So Nehemiah was very wise. He moved forward very slowly, very methodically. He listened to God, and he took everything one step at a time. Well, the king, God puts favor on the king's heart. The king releases Nehemiah from his duties, sends him off to Jerusalem to rebuild the wall for the Israelites, and he also, I love it in chapter 2 of Nehemiah, we see that the king 
gave him more than Nehemiah, than Nehemiah even asked. He gave him an army to help protect him. He gave him letters to give him safe passages through foreign lands. He gave him wood and provisions from some of the most beautiful places. It was more than what Nehemiah asked for. And I just love that we have a God of more. We have a God of abundance. And when he puts something in our heart, he puts favor in our life for those things to be carried out. Our job is to have faith. Our job is to be obedient. And our job is to be strong, courageous, and have a persevering spirit. Because you're going to face an enemy, a real enemy, who might have rules and play ways that you don't even know. And so... Nehemiah was smart. He walked closely with God. He moved in the timing of God. And when he came against opposition, he went to God, he prayed, and then he kept persevering, and he kept having victory, uh, and victory, victory, victory over that enemy. And in 52 days, Nehemiah and the Israelite people working together under the protection of God, under the provision of God, and with the power of God, they were able to fulfill what God had put on Nehemiah's heart. You know, when God is for you, nobody can be against you. But you do have to move forward with wisdom and discernment and the provision and the power of God. So I want us to look at Nehemiah right now. I want us to learn from his example because I think that it is just an amazing example of how we need to go to work doing what God's called us to do on a daily basis, whether that's serving in a ministry or um, raising your children or working in, in a workplace somewhere. We're going to be attacked. Satan does not play fair, and he just wants to stop you in your tracks and discourage you. And so let's look at... Um, Chapter 2, verse 19. So we see here that Nehemiah and the Israelites, they have started the work of rebuilding the temple. And it says in verse 19, But when Sanballat, and forgive me if you're a historian and you know how to pronounce these names, and I don't, uh, I am from the South. So I'm just going <laughs> to just gonna say them how I think they should be Say Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem, the Arab, heard of our plan. They scoffed contemptuously. And they said, what are you doing? Are you rebelling against the king? So they're, they're bringing accusations against Nehemiah. Nehemiah replied, the God of heaven will help us succeed. We, his servants, will start rebuilding this wall. But you have no share, legal right, or historic claim in Jerusalem. Right here, right off the bat, I think we learn an important truth. When the enemy comes against you, if you know who you are, and if you know who God is and who you are as his child, you know that exactly what Nehemiah said right here applies to you too. We can look at the enemy when they are coming at us and however form the enemy comes at us, and we can say, the God of heaven will help me succeed. I am his servant, and I'm going to go do what he has called me to do, but you have no say. You have no share. You have no legal right or historic claim in my life. Right here, Nehemiah sets up the authority that he has. And he comes against the authority that the enemy thinks that he has. If you remember, I closed out last session talking about the authority that we have as children of the king. God sent his son Jesus to die for our sins, to pay for the penalty, to pay the price for our sin, to cover the cost of everything that any man has ever done. And when he died and he rose again, he gave the authority of heaven back to his people, the authority that was taken in the garden when Adam and Eve sinned. And so we have the authority. And I could go so deep in that, but I don't want to do that in this session. But the thing is, if you don't know who you are, and if you don't know who God is, and you're not aware of the way that the enemies play, and you're going to be defeated every time. Well, right here, Nehemiah knew, God's called me to do this. And God is with me. He's going to help me succeed. And you, enemy, are not going to stop me. 
But we see that Nehemiah does not just run off to go do his work. He stays close to God. He walks in wisdom. He's praying. He's persevering. He's discerning the lies that are coming at him and and, um, refusing to believe them. He's motivating the people. He's standing guard. He's got a plan. And so that's how we have to move forward when we face the enemy. First, we, when we come against opposition, we say, the Lord, our my God, the Lord, our God is going to help us. And you, Satan, you have no legal claim over my children. You have no legal claim over this ministry. And so that's number one I want us to realize. But you know what? These scoffers, these enemies are not going to just stop. They don't just walk away. You know, the Bible says, resist the enemy and he will flee from you. But what he does is he waits for an opportunity to come back. And we see that with Jesus. When Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, we see Satan comes against him. Jesus resists him. Satan comes against him again. He resists him. Satan comes again. He resists him. And it says the devil left, but he was waiting for another opportune time. And so we want to make sure we're always on guard. We want to make sure we're doing the work like Nehemiah does on guard with a plan and with God. And so the enemy does not stay quiet for long. We're going to move over to um, chapter 4. I love this. So the wall is start going up, and it says Sanballat, or as we would say in the south, Sanballat, was very angry when he learned that we were rebuilding the wall. This is Nehemiah talking. And he flew into a rage, and he mocked the Jews. God's children, saying in front of their friends and the Sumerian army officers, what does this bunch of poor, feeble Jews think they're doing? Do they think they can build the wall in a single day just by offering a few sacrifices? Notice how the enemy just plays down what you have, plays down what you're doing, plays down your ability. Do you think, do they think they can actually make something of the stones from a rubbish heap and charred stones at that? I just love that. They are just, this is what the enemy does. He comes at you when you are determined to walk in faith and you're determined to live a godly life and you're determined to move forward as God would have you move forward. What the enemy does is he then comes against you. He might come against you in the form of a person like this who's actually mocking you to your face, to um, maybe in front of your peers, to make you look stupid or small. And then he comes at you and comes against the very things that are in you. You think that you can accomplish anything just by making a few sacrifices, just by believing in God. You think God's going to help you. Who do you think you are, you feeble person? Satan comes against us, and he'll, he'll come against us in our minds. He'll come against us with circumstances that make us question, can I really accomplish anything with God? Would God use me? What I have is nothing like this. It's charred stones at that. But God was ready to do something with the charred stones. He was ready to do something with the people. He was ready to use them to do the impossible. And that's what God does with us. But the enemy wants you to question your value. He wants you to question your ability. He wants to question question what you're doing. Like, if if you were, think about it, if you were there building and someone's laughing at you and saying, you really think you're going to be able to do anything with that? Well, that might be what the enemy's saying to you. You really think you can go do what God's told you to do with what you have, with what you're using? And you know what God says? Yes. All you need is a little bit. And give it to God. Whatever it is you've got, you give to him. And like David, he used a little bitty stone and took down the giant. Like the lady with the, the oil. She had a little bit of oil and she gave it to the prophet and, and it never ran out. It kept multiplying. Think about the fish and the loaves in, in the New Testament. How God took what that little boy had and he multiplied it. So don't ever let the enemy convince you that you're small. Go back and watch the videos about who you are. You are a champion in God's eyes. You are treasured in Him. You are more than a conqueror. His power lives in you. You are a child of the King. So don't let the enemy, like he's going to do, come against your ability, your purpose, your plan, your resources. 
and get you to second guess it. He's trying to get them to second guess what they're doing. So then it says, Tobiah, this is verse 3 in chapter 4, Tobiah the Ammonite who was standing beside him. So there, there's a lot, couple of them jeering. He remarked, that stone wall will collapse even if a fox walks on top of it. So they're just mocking and making fun of. And that's what the enemy will do. He might do it internally. He might send thoughts to you. Or there may be a group of people laughing at you at school, laughing at you at the prison that you're at, laughing at you at work. I know I've even had friends that I thought were friends that are mocking and laughing and, and who do you think you are trying to get me to question things. And so the enemy does not play fair and he will use different means and different people and different words and circumstances to get you to question God to twist the truth. Remember, we learned in, in John eight forty four that he is a liar. He is the father of lies and there is no truth in him. And we've also learned in Ephesians that our war is not against flesh and blood. Ephesians 6, 10, I believe it is. It's not 10 or 11 or 12, run it there. We, it's not against flesh and blood. It's not against the person with the mouth. It's not against Tobiah. It's not against Sanballat, Balat, whatever his name is. See, behind Tobias, behind these people, they're trying to stop Nehemiah. What are they trying to do? They're trying to stop the work of God. That is the whole plan of Satan, is to stop the call of God on your life, to stop the work of God that's going to be carried out through your life. That's why he doesn't play fair. He starts when you're young, maybe even when you're in your mother's womb. Some of you were born in families where it might have been your own loved ones who should have been caring for you, and Satan's using them like he was using T Tobias and the Sandman here, Sandbalot. You know, using them to tell you you're nothing, to question your abilities and question who you are and to question the God that you serve. And so always remember that behind those voices, behind those words, is an enemy who wants to stop the work of God. He also does not want your life to be rebuilt. He does not want, if your life's in ruins, it's been just, it's total rubble, and you've got nothing left but charred pieces. The enemy does not want you to pick them up, to give them to God, and for him to rebuild your life. In, in a very short time, even, is what he can do. He can rebuild your life in a short time. So God, he doesn't want you moving forward with God. Because the enemy knows what happens when you get lined up with your belief system according to the word of God. And you're walking with God and the spirit and the power of God listening to him. The enemy knows nothing can stop you. So that's why he's going to come at you. He's going to mock you. He's going to try to bring confusion. We're going to see that. So um, here is Nehemiah's response to their mocking saying what you're going to do is never going to work. Even if a fox runs across that wall, it's going to, a little bitty fox is going to knock that thing down. And then Nehemiah prays. So this is what we got to do. We got to know our authority and we got to pray. Nehemiah prays, hear us, our God, for we are being mocked. So if you, people are coming against you and they're saying things to you, get on your knees and say, God, would you hear my heart? And the Bible promises that when we come to God, he does hear his children. God, they're mocking me. They're, they're coming against what I feel that you're saying I'm to do. They're telling me that I'm not enough and I'm not good enough. They're, they're laughing at your people, God. And so that's what he does. Tell God how you feel. Tell him what you're up against. He knows. He just wants you to come to him so he can give you his peace, his comfort, his joy, his provision, his plan, his creativity. And so that's what Nehemiah does. And then he kind of gets real here. He says, may their scoffing fall back on their own heads and may, them th may they themselves become captives in a foreign land. Do not ignore their guilt, God. Do not blot out their sins. You know, I have a hard time praying against enemies like that. I just feel like we're to bless our enemies and pray for them and um, heap coals of blessings upon their head. But here we see, we see a lot in David too, they're saying, God, don't ignore what they're doing because they are coming against your work, your kingdom work. And, and I do pray this a lot. Lord, if they're not going to turn to you, make everything that the enemy does to come after me turn back and 
boomerang back. Make the wheels on their chariots fall off, just like it did on the Egyptians when the Egyptians were chasing after the Israelites. And so those are the type prayers that I pray. So you need to pray. You need to know your authority. You need to, uh, you need to pray. You need to shut your ears to the lies and remember the truth. At last, it says in chapter 4, verse 6 of Nehemiah, at last the wall was completed to half its height around the entire city. I mean, this is amazing. And it says, verse 7, But when Sandalot and Tobiah and the Arabs, Ammonites, and Ashdodites heard that the work was going ahead and that the gaps in the wall of Jerusalem were being repaired, See, God is in the repairing business. He does not want gaps in our hearts, in our minds, in our thinking. And so he wants to go to work with us to fill the gaps. And that makes the enemy very, very nervous. When he sees your life and my life being restored, when he sees us moving out, doing what God's called us to do, seeing the gaps closed, people of God working together, the enemy gets stirred. He gets scared. And it says they were furious and he gets angry and he unleashes his anger. They all made plans. So this is the enemy is making plans to come against Jerusalem to fight. And then it says to throw us into confusion. But we prayed. See, the devil wants you confused. I look at our nation right now and I see nothing but confusion. It's the enemy's tactics. He's tried fear. He's tried wagging his tongue. And now he's trying to throw us into confusion to attack us because he knows that the work of God is being done. Here's what Nehemiah's response was. But he prayed. But he prayed to God. And he guarded the city day and night. So when you know the enemy's coming against you, and he is, you got to be on guard. You got to be watching. You got to make sure the gaps are closed. You got to make sure that there's no open door. You're not giving the enemy a foothold in your life. And so the people of Judah then started complaining. And when you get a complaining spirit and stuff like that, you got to watch it because that's an open door for the enemy. Unforgiveness is an open door for the enemy. Bitterness is an open door for the enemy. Fear is an open door for the enemy. Guilt and shame, condemnation, all those things, busyness, fatigue, all those are open doors, there are gaps in our life where the enemy's going to try to come in and jump us, take us captive when we're least expecting it. So the, the people started complaining. They were getting tired. Meanwhile, the enemy's watching all this, and they're saying in verse 11, I love this, before they know what's happened, we will swoop down on them and kill them and end their work. There's the the end goal to end their work and what was their work it was God's work I think again back to that game when when Ira and I were playing and and I jumped I'm, I'm like I got it I'm getting ready to go get kinged and all of a sudden she backwards jumped and I'm like what in the world are you doing she took me when I was least expecting it because I didn't know how she was playing the game she was playing the Ukrainian checkers not the American checkers and so same thing the, youth, you, the enemy wants to swoop down on you and take you out when you least expect it and you don't even know what hit you. The Jews who live near the enemy came and told us again. See, God has a way of letting you know when the enemy's coming against you. It says they will come from all directions and attack. So Nehemiah was wise. He got a plan from God. He set up guards. In the exposed areas, he set up guards. I think one of the wisest things that we can do is to examine our life and make sure, examine our ministries, examine our families, examine our workplaces, our finances, and see where there's a weak area. And then set up a guard there. Close the gap. Put someone on watch. Don't let the enemy have access. Don't let him have opportunity to take you when you're least expecting it. Be on guard. How can you be on guard? Being alert praying, seeking God's face, listening to the word of God, going through life with a sensitive spirit, discerning where God's working, where he's not, discerning truth, identifying the lies. That's how we can avoid being overtaken and sidetracked and swooped down upon by the enemy. Remember, he's portrayed as a lion that's, that's out roaming about this world, looking for a gap looking for a way to swoop in, to jump in and devour you. 
the families, they bound together and they took up, they, they started standing guard and working together. And that's another thing that if we as Christians would stand together with our faith, so much more would happen and so much more victory would happen. So um, Nehemiah looks over the situation. He calls together the nobles and the rest of the people and says, and this is what I want to say to you. Do not be afraid of the enemy. This is verse 14, chapter 4 of Nehemiah. Don't be afraid of the enemy. Remember the Lord who is great and glorious and, and fight for your brothers, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your homes. What Nehemiah is saying and what I'm saying to you and what God is saying to us is do not be afraid of this enemy. Remember the Lord God who is your father, who is strong and mighty and glorious and able to do abundantly more than you could ever hope for or imagine. He is the God that is on your side and he is the God that's fighting for you. He's the God that's providing for you and equipping you for the battle. So don't be afraid. Don't give this enemy any foothold whatsoever and you go out you march out you do the work of God and you fight how do you fight you fight in the spirit for your weapons of this warfare are not carnal you don't just go out and speak words and hit people no you go out in the spirit you pray that's what Nehemiah did you pray you work you move forward in wisdom and with the help of the Holy Spirit when the enemies heard that Nehemiah knew what was going on and that God had frustrated the enemy's plans see that's what God does he frustrates the enemy's plans we all returned to our work on the wall. And then half the men worked and half stood on guard. But each man, I love this, it says that they worked with one hand and they held a weapon with the other. And I believe that that's what we've got to do. As we move forward in this world, especially in times like this, in times like this world is going through right now where the enemy is trying to sneak up on our family, our kids through internet, through relationships, through condemnation, through confusion, intimidation, all these things. We need to be wise. We need to know who is on our side. And we need to have the sword of God as our weapon. Now I want to stop here for a second. I want to turn to Ephesians 6. Because Ephesians 6 tells us how to fight. It says a final word, Ephesians 6.10. So this is Paul talking to the church of Ephesus. He says, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor. So when you are going out to fight, you remember who's for you. It's God. You go out and you face the battle with God in his armor. And you put it on every day. What is his armor? Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm. So you'll be able to stand. You'll be able to have the victory. For we are not, you know, stand firm against all the strategies of the devil, all his moves. Verse 12, for we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies. We've said that. But against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. And can I just say that they do not play fair. So put on every piece of God's armor so that you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Not when, not if, but when the time of evil comes. It's coming. But you will be able to stand. And after the battle, you're still going to be standing. So here's your pieces of your armor. Put on the belt of truth. Now you got to remember, Paul spent a lot of time he spent a lot of time in prison. He spent a lot of time around Roman officers and army military people, the commanders. And he was looking at their attire. And he's got, he says, put on that belt of truth. That belt was the thing that held everything together. It held the, the thigh pieces the, the, around the loin belt. It, it held, um, excuse me, the loin belt held the, the breastplate of righteousness. It's what the weapons and things attach to. The truth, belt of truth, the word of God, the spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit. Those are the things that we've got to walk through this life with. That is what holds us together. Everything in our life is held together with the truth. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set, shall set you free and give you the victory. So you have the truth of God. 
You put on the breastplate of righteousness. You see, we have no righteousness in and of ourselves. It is Jesus Christ who died for us, paid the penalty for all of our sins, and then rose again. And I truly believe that. And the Bible says that if you have faith to believe that, then you have the righteousness of God. You have been made through your faith righteous. Not because I go and do something, but because his righteousness, Jesus' righteousness, his right standing with God, that's what that word means, is imputed to us. His perfectness, I know that's not a word, his perfect standard that he carried out is imputed to us. So when God looks at us, you can put on that breastplate of, of righteousness. When the enemy comes against you and says, who, you, who are you? You say, I am the righteousness of God. I am perfect in God's sight. Am I perfect? No. But in his sight, he sees no fault in me. He loves me. And I'm standing on that truth. For shoes, so remember, Paul's looking at the, the army, um, the officers, and he's looking at their shoes. Now, those Roman officers, they had shoes with deep spikes in it so they could stand firm, like spikes six inches up on some of them that would go down into the ground that would hold them as they're trying to go up mountains. And, you know, the Bible says that he gives us feet like a hind goat, able to stand in the heights, able to stand firm in the heights, in rocky places. These shoes of peace. What is the peace? Like right now I have peace with all the chaos going on in the world. And it helps me stand firm. And I'm not shaken because I have the peace of God that passes all understanding. Because I believe his word to be true. And the actual peace of God is a gift of the Holy Spirit. He gives you this, this gift of peace that guards your heart and your mind. And so when I walk out into this world, I walk out with my shoes of peace on. That enables me to walk through battles, to walk in high difficult, slippery places that would normally take people out. You and I are able to stand in the peace of God, knowing who we are and whose we are and who He is, and move forward. It's the peace that comes from the good news. What is the good news? It's that Jesus loves us, that He saves us, that He's for us, so that you will be fully prepared. The peace prepares us. In addition to um, your belt, of truth and your breastplate of righteousness in addition to your shoes of peace you want to take up the shield of faith what is the faith it is believing that God is who he says he is that his promises will not fail it is faith to know that he's got your back and I hold this up because it's a shield and that shield was about the size of a door like a three by five foot door and they would hold that shield up. And what the, the military people would do is they would march into battle together, locking their shields together. And some would hold the shields over their heads so that when the fiery darts of the enemy were fired at them, they would hit the shield. And the shield was actually leather and anointed with oil. And it, it was had oil on the leather, but it was drenched with water. And it could not catch fire. It would extinguish it would extinguish the flames, the fiery darts of the enemy. Your faith in God, your shoes of peace, that shield, um, that breastplate of righteousness protects you. It says put on your helmet of salvation that you know that God has saved you. You are covered from head to toe to walk into the battle against the enemy and know that you are protected. That salvation is your helmet. Your faith stops the fiery arrows of the devil. You take the sword of the Spirit. That is the spoken word of God. The rhema word of God. So you have your truth of God right here. The word of God. But you also have the um, spoken word of God. And so that's how you walk in the battle. And that's what Nehemiah was doing. He was pray And it also says in Ephesians 6 to pray without ceasing. Pray in the Spirit. Pray as God leads you. And that's what Nehemiah did. So I want to close up because I know we're getting um, a little bit long, but Nehemiah, you know, they move forward. The enemies have heard about the plans. They've tried to stop it, but they continued the work through prayer, through perseverance. Don't quit. Keep fighting that good fight of faith. They uh, worked with one hand and they had a, a weapon in the other. And so they move forward. 
the enemy did everything it could to intimidate. Read chapter 6, verse 9. They were trying to intimidate us, imagining that they could discourage us and stop the work. So you know what Nehemiah says? So I continued the work with even greater determination. I continued the work with even greater determination. You know, as I continue to read this, and I just really do want to um, close it up, the enemy kept coming against them. But Nehemiah, when they would come at him with letters, they would come at him with words, with invitations to go places, he would stop, he would pray, and he would have discernment. God would show them, this is not a word from me. This is a place you do not need to go because they're going to attack you. He always, he, say, he says, but I realized that they were not from God. But I realized they had set a trap. And so he didn't fall prey to the enemy because he was wise in how he operated. He was always listening for the voice and the direction of God. And he wasn't afraid. He was a determined man. And I just love that. The enemy is coming against us. But he is a defeated foe. It says that Jesus came to destroy the works of the enemy. So yeah, the enemy might be trying to stop the work of God that he wants to carry out through us. But guess what? Jesus Christ has already come and he's destroyed the works of the enemy. He has no way to defeat you except if you fall prey to his tactics. If you decide to listen to his intimidating words, if you fall into confusion, if you keep weak spots in your life and open up doors and carry bitterness and frustration and, and unforgiveness in your heart, it opens up a door. If you think that what you have is nothing, then, then you won't ever go to work. So I want to encourage you today, as Nehemiah said, be strong. Don't fear the enemy that is coming against you. You know, this is an awareness series about who the enemy is and about his tactics. But the one thing I don't want to do is give him too much credit. He doesn't play fair. And he brings a lot of pain and destruction into this world. But he does that because he knows he's defeated. And he does not have the power to defeat us even now. When the rains come in our life, when the storms hit, the Bible says that a wise person is one that has built his life upon the Word of God, that goes into battle with the Word, with God's promises, with their shield of faith, walking in the shoes of peace, knowing that they're a child of the King. And they keep marching forward, determined with a persevering heart. And guess what? Whatever God has called you to do, it shall be done. Nothing can come against the work of God except if we decide to stop, except if we decide to listen to the voices of the enemies. Don't trade the truth of God for a lie. Don't fall prey to the enemy's tactics. I, I want to pray for us as I close. I hope this has helped you. There's so much more I want to say on this, but I think we passed our 30 minutes, or maybe even 40 minutes, so I'm going to bring it to a close. But I want you to know this. I love you. I appreciate you. And I am praying for your victory. In the name of Jesus, I ask God to empower you with the Spirit of God right now. To give you courage. To give you a persevering heart and a persevering mind. For you to know how much God loves you in a fresh new way. To understand the power of God that is for you. And that you will understand the enemy's tactics. That you will start walking in wisdom. Discernment. And walking in the plans of God. Take one step at a time, my friend. He's got your back. And you in Him are more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. Slides are going to be coming up. You can connect with us um, if you're in prison by writing to us at the address that's listed on the slides. Hey, we're always looking for partners. If you're watching this on YouTube, I invite you to go to VictoriousLivingMagazine.com. And please, 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 just look at what's going on in our ministry. We need you to help us deliver hope to some of the darkest places in the world, prison. And uh, you can go and um, any dollar that you donate to our ministry sends one of our magazines, Victorious Living Magazines, into prison, which will touch multiple, multiple lives for many years to come. Thank you so much for your support. Thank you for your love and your prayers. And I look forward to seeing you next time for more Monday.